Hey guys, we want to welcome you back to a, um, another, our, our second episode of our video FPCO Tribute Podcast. We hope that you enjoyed the first one as we're kind of making this a, a weekly thing. And so when I was talking with Marie, she really wanted to make this kind of a series and look at something that would kind of flow through over multiple um, episodes. And so we kind of settled on going through um, the Gospel of Mark. And so we're going to kind of pick up with that in chapter 1. And we won't go necessarily verse by verse through every piece, but we want to cover all of the major themes of that Gospel. And that really starts out with John the Baptist. I mean, he's kind of the guy, because Mark's interesting, because there's no Christmas story. It just really starts. But there's no genealogy. Mm -hmm. It's like John. John and Mark are a little bit different. John is extremely different than the other guys. John is more detailed in a lot of ways, isn't it? Or Luke, is that... um, Luke is actually the longest of the Gospels, and I think the most detailed. But John just kind of comes at things from a way different perspective. Um, Matthew, Luke, and Mark are known as the synoptic Gospels. They all kind of play off of each other, and John kind of has its own flavor. It's a little bit different, which is really interesting. It's just interesting though because you have to know all of them to really get the full story yeah, yeah, on yeah. a lot of characters like John. Yes. You don't get the full story in just one. Yeah, no, no. You had these four different remembrances of the events. Um, all of them being first-hand accounts. John's a first-hand account. Matthew next first-hand account. The interesting thing with the Gospel of Mark is I think a better title would be the Gospel of Peter because pretty much all Bible scholars believe that Peter is the source for all of Mark's information. We know that after Mark parted ways with Paul, um, they had some disagreements and issues. Um, John Mark kind of got homesick and left and went back home uh, when he was traveling with Peter or Paul, and Paul did not like this. They they kind of made up later. So why is it called Mark? Well, Mark wrote it? is who actually wrote it. He was, I would almost picture in this situation, Mark is like the secretary. And we call him Mark. His name was John Mark. But we call him Mark to kind of separate him from the Gospel sort of, of John. Sort of like you. Sort of like me. But um, he was the secretary for Peter. And so he pretty much just wrote it down as Peter told him. One of the interesting things with Peter himself, Peter was not a very educated man. His Greek, when I was taking Greek in seminary, they talked about like First and Second Peter. Those were not books that like early on when you were studying Greek that you worked with or used because the grammar was so atrocious. So it makes sense that he would have someone yes. write for him. Yeah, so Mark kind of wrote for him. So he was kind of his secretary there. And so Mark's the actual person that penned it. But really in a lot of ways, most Bible scholars think that that it was him. It was, it was Peter's actual remembrances. Um, that were there. It's also thought to be the earliest of the Gospels. Um, some people take it back to um, the late 40s, early 50s AD. So you're talking about something that was written 15 years after the events had hmm. taken place, you know, 18 years kind of at the outside. So this was. So how old do you think Peter was then? Peter was uh, John was younger. Peter was probably middle aged ish. You know, he was probably closer to Jesus's age when he was with Jesus, and so he would have been a man in his late forties, maybe fifty. And they didn't live a long time. No, no, their lifespans were not were not that long. They they didn't live a long, long time, and so Peter was kind of an older man when he was recounting this to Mark, who was a much who was a much younger guy, and he was really kind of a disciple of Peter's. You know, like Peter was passing on to him because there was that next generation, and Mark was kind of one of those guys in that next generation. Luke was a guy in that next generation. Timothy, you know, Titus, those were that next generation after those first set of apostles. And so the Gospel of Mark's our first gospel, and Matthew and Luke also have a lot of the same um, stories and things in them. Um, Luke wrote later and probably used Mark's gospel as a source because, you know, he wasn't there for any of it. His were all sources like Mark, Matthew, 
And then eyewitness accounts from people like John, Mary. A lot of people think that he actually sat down and talked to Mary and got the the yeah. story of the birth straight from her, it's which would be fascinating to, to like, listen to. Think about um, Peter as an older man telling a story. We can all think of people that we like to sit down and listen to them tell yeah. stories from um, their past. And then... Um, Luke is like an investigator type of person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luke's Luke's the investigative journalist yeah. almost. He's the historian. He's the Luke was incredibly educated man. He was like Paul. He was a very educated man. Mm -hmm. And so you know he's coming in putting all these pieces together. And so Mark's that first gospel coming from this disciple that had had some great mountaintop experiences and it failed a lot. But when you look at this, it opens up just and jumps pretty much straight into. John the Baptist. It just, boom, here we are. John the Baptist is here. Whereas Luke talks about even John the Baptist's birth and um, Zechariah mm -hmm. and Elizabeth, his mother and father and all that. This just jumps in and he's a grown man. It just picks up right there. So Luke gives you much more detail. Now, are you going to bring in some of the details from the other? Oh, yeah, you'll gospel. have to. You'll have to. Because some of the Gospels, like Mark may tell you a story, like it may give an account, and then Matthew or, or Luke may have it and gives you even greater detail. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels and, and gives you probably the least amount of detail. Luke, Luke and Matthew give more detail, with Luke probably being the most detail-oriented. So, yeah, we'll definitely have to reference that. And it's appropriate to reference those things. And John has bleed over, too. There's things that are in John that are in the other Gospels as well. You know, like the, intro, the beginning of the book of John is so incredibly interesting because it's not like any of the Gospels. You know, it breaks out with, you know, the Word was with God, yeah. the Word was God. You know, so, I mean, it just takes this totally different tact in doing that. Mark, the Gospel of Mark is most likely written for kind of a Roman um, audience. It has a lot of Latin phrases even in it, uh, and it has a lot of Aramaic phrases, which is what Peter would have spoken. So that makes sense, Peter being the guy that's the kind of the secretary in this situation, or Mark being the secretary for Peter. It kind of makes sense. So, And it was most likely written when Peter was in Rome. So it's got a big, a big Roman influence. So it kind of, it doesn't rely as much on the Jew... Judy, Judaism's background as much as some of the other Gospels. Like Matthew relies heavily and is very much aimed at a Jewish background, people with a Jewish background and a Jewish understanding. Which one did you say? Matthew. Now, Mark is much more just for like the, the Roman Latin people with no with no Jewish background or understanding. It kind of gives this to you in a little different fashion. All the Gospels are kind of aimed at different groups and different people and even have different themes among them. So let's jump into this and look at verses 1 through 5 for a minute. It says there, This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So John is prophesied about. And we all hear about John the Baptist. And you, know, you kind of know that he's John the Baptist, okay, baptized. And everybody associates that you know, with him. But he was prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 40 and in Malachi chapter 3. So he was somebody that was that we're looking for. He was the forerunner. Now, my question about that, though, is, and Christ mentioned this, I think, in Matthew, which makes sense that you said that it's more for those who have that um, Judaic background. But he refers to him as Elijah mm -hmm. in those verses. So yeah. what does that mean? He was seen, in a lot of ways, he duplicated a lot of Elijah's like way of doing things. Elijah really stood out. Elijah was very confrontational. You know, you think about Elijah's like confrontations with Ahab and Jezebel mm -hmm. and how when the nation of Israel was far from God, here's Elijah over in the wilderness yelling. You know, he was, he was in people's faces. Which is sort of like what John does with um, talking to the Pharisees yes. and when um, Herod. Herod comes through and yeah. he 
calls him out on his sin. He does. He calls him out on his sin because he is, um, at that point, Herod was like in a very sketchy relationship and it was a real bad scene. And then that's how John's head winds up on the platter. Wow. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a bad thing. And so just as there was a king that hated John and wound up, you know, killing, having him killed, you know, Ahab hated Elijah and had him killed. And so they were both kind of these lone voices. You know, you think about Elijah was up on the top of Mount Carmel and he was battling the 400 prophets of Baal. You know, they were going back and forth. And he was the only one. He was the only one on God's side. At the end of the day, all the prophets of Baal were dead and all the people had bowed down before God, you know, when the, the, the fire came down and consumed the offering and all that. So John was kind of out in the wilderness and Isaiah talks about this. He says in um, 40 verse 3, he says, Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. So, Why do you think he needed that though? I don't know. I don't know. John definitely was interesting in how he prepared the way. He was calling the people to repentance. Like even when Christ comes to be baptized by John the Baptist, John says, look who it is, and basically declares that this is the Son of God. The Son of God. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me like when a um, person of royalty comes through, they have this grand entrance. I mean, yeah. is that was, what it was, uh, was? It was Historically, or? it was called a crier, if I remember right. Right. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think that um, there's there's some kind of allusion to that, that there was people that went ahead of the king and they made sure the path was clear and they told everybody was coming. That was kind of John's job. And another thing that's interesting with John, he had already earned the people's respect. I mean, when you look back up there in verse 5, all of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So they were already listening to John, so... John was famous. They were going out from the city to see him to the Jordan River. And it was a little bit of a haul from Jerusalem to the Jordan River. I mean, you know, that was, was a walk. You know, I had to go a little bit. Yeah. And so, Christ's ministry was really not that long. Oh, no, no. It was three, three and a half years. years. So I guess if John could have made it easier for people to... Immediately recognize him. Right. And so John kind of puts his stamp on him. And John even talks about... I'm not worthy to basically tie his shoes. You know, that's to be the, the way we'd say it today. He talks about lacing his sandals or whatever. I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. He didn't want to baptize him. Mm -hmm. You know, he was like, I'm not worthy. You need to be baptizing me. What's going on here? And Jesus says, nope, this is how it's supposed to be. So he was that person crying out. And, you know, he was, he was the first real prophetic voice in Israel for hundreds of years. From the, the end of the Old Testament to the start of the New Testament, chronologically, is like about 400 years. There's like, it's oftentimes referred to as the, the silence. There was nothing. Um, and some people have, have tried to say, well, God was mad at them, and so he didn't, he, he didn't send anything. This was judgment. I don't agree with that. God had been extremely upset with Israel because of their sins before and had judged them before. Why make silence now? I think it was so that generations would pass and when John and then Christ right after him came on the scene, it would grab the people. Like, you didn't see miracles. There was no prophets. There was nobody standing up doing this. It was very quiet from God. They still had all the Old Testament and they still taught the Old Testament. They still were following the Jewish traditions, but there wasn't anything necessarily new happening. So when Jesus busts onto the scene, I mean, even Jesus himself, when they talk about, you know, who, when Peter, um, or Jesus asks him, says, who do, who, do, who do people say I am? Some, some say you're, you're Elijah. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that was even said. And then Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I think Christ even said at one point that things are happening very quickly to bring about God's will and to fulfill the prophecies. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was quiet, and then a lot happened in a very, very quick, a short amount of yeah, time. Yeah, span of time. Like, you, you even go to the end of Jesus' earthly life before the crucifixion. He, he comes into Jerusalem, and everybody's you know, Hosanna to the Son of David. They're laying down the palm branches, and they're, they're, they're laying their, their coats and their cloaks down, and mm -hmm. he's riding in. And then a few days later, they're shouting, Crucify him. Things mm -hmm. turned on a dime. 
And you know, so that was very much Jesus' ministry. I mean, it was quick, you know, comparative to, to what we would think about. Like, I've, I, I've been a, a pastor now for, you know, over 20 years. And Jesus' earthly ministry lasted for such a brief period of time. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, goodness gracious, what, you know, he accomplished in that brief period of time. So John was kind of the start of that. He was that first authentic voice. So... Um, here in this too, it makes it very clear who Jesus is. Mark Mark really makes this clear as he's talking. Um, he he says there, um, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. Prepare the way for you. He's a voice shout in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord is coming. Clear the road for him. It talks about the messenger was you know John the Baptist. And when I look at this, you go back to verse one. He says, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So he's making it real clear, real quick, who Jesus is. And people want to try to say Jesus was always oh, a great teacher, was a moral man. No, I can't really do that. Like he either was the Messiah, the Son of God, or not. You can't really separate those two things because he himself claimed to be the Son of God. And in the Bible, he, he says it himself. So it's, it's, it's really right there in front of you. Now, an interesting thing that, that hits you right there is that phrase, Son of God. I use that phrase, but when I do, I like to try to explain it sometimes. Because when I think son of, like I'm the son of Don McCarter, okay, that's my dad, but I'm my own person. So I think sometimes people will confuse it because people call Jesus the son of God, and it can confuse you and make you think he's not God. He is. Because the Jews had a really different take on it. The Jews looked at it and saw it as... If you were the son of someone, you were the same substance as that person. So by Jesus claiming to be the son of God, he was saying he was of the same substance, character, and nature of God, meaning he was God. And you like to say God the son. I do like to say that. I say God the son because I think that flips it and makes it really apparent to people who we're dealing with, you know, because John understood, John the Baptist understood. He knew who he was. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew he was God. He knew he was the Lord. Do you think he knew the whole time or God revealed that to him later? If you go to the book of Luke, he's talking about bringing some other gospels. You go to the book of Luke, when he was in Elizabeth's stomach before he was ever born, he right. jumped. Right, he jumped he because, he, the because he recognized what the holy spirit or that he i think he recognized the holy spirit and he also he recognized mary he knew what was happening it is so interesting to me is there a place in matthew that talks about how god said whoever something about the dove if the the dove that comes from heaven and lands on his shoulder that is the one who will bring the holy spirit or I'm that making that up. I that absolutely know. happens when 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 John baptizes Jesus. I know it happens, but I didn't know if it also said that that's what God revealed to him. I don't remember that. Maybe it's there. I mean, I can't tell you. I have the entire New Testament that memorized. I, really don't remember, I don't have. But, I will. I will look at that. I will look okay. at that though. But I don't have that all 100 percent memorized. So John's in the wilderness preaching, and he's preaching people to be baptized. Baptism is interesting. We think of baptism as being something just Christians do. Baptism was around a long time before Christians. It was a Jewish ritual that really Christ kind of adapted and changed the meaning of. Was it a sect amongst some of the it Jews? Was, it was something that was done most of the time when somebody converted, when a Gentile converted to Judaism. A baptism was something that they would do to kind of show their cleansing from sin and their okay. change um, and joining that that covenant, that Abrahamic covenant going right. all the way back to Genesis chapter um, 17. But just a circumcision or something like that wouldn't have done the same thing? It was something they did. They a lot of times did in addition to. The circumcision was the main sign of the covenant, but they would do that in addition to. And so it was rare for a Jew to be baptized. So John kind of was taking this in a different direction, and he was baptizing these Jews. Okay. And it was all a part of repentance, and it was you know forgiveness for their sins. It was this ceremonial immersion. Didn't mean the same thing to the Jewish people John was baptizing as it means to us. The, the, the actual baptism was the same because John baptized by immersion, and he's doing it in the Jordan River. 
Um, but some of the other Jews do the same thing. They've actually found um, what would be considered in, in ancient Israel like baptismals where they had carved them out and they would fill them with water and they had steps going down where they would do this kind of thing. Just for Gentiles? Mostly just for Gentiles. It was a rarity for a Jew to do this up until the time of John. See, the Jews at this point were very much just into their religious rituals and just kind of going through the motions mm -hmm. like a lot of Christians do. We go through the motions. Well, and you have to remember they hadn't heard from God in, what, a century? Yeah, it had been a long time. So... Yeah, and so kind now it makes sense that they're falling back on just tradition. They did. They fell back on the tradition and, and the legalism right. and you know the Pharisaical laws and all those kind of things. And so John spins it, and he's like, "No, nope, it's not about these rituals. It's about repentance and forgiveness of sin. Like you're seeking forgiveness of sin, and there's a change. Because repentance means to to have a change in your mind that then changes your actions. See, repentance isn't about asking forgiveness. That's that that's a different thing." Repentance is not just about understanding as forgiveness for sin, it's about a change in action. And so John was called to do a change in action, which was preparing the way for what Christ was going to do. Because that's exactly Christ extended that on and actually brought salvation that lasted, like an eternal salvation because of the, the sacrifice on the cross, going along with what John was doing with the, the baptism. Like John was kind of giving them a preview. John, like several other people in the Bible, is kind of a for he he was he was the the announcer, but he was also kind of a forerunner. He was giving you a little picture, a little image of what Christ would do uh, ahead of time, and then Jesus well, came in and fulfilled all the rest. And it, of it just shows though that the act of baptism isn't the point. The point is the change in heart yeah. and what's going to come from that change of heart. That's what John was trying to get across. That it's it's not about the ritual; it's about the change of heart. And the baptism was what he was doing was very similar to what Christians do in the the idea that baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. But I still think even as Christians today, we can fall back on yeah. ritual and say, "Oh, well, I was baptized when I was five, and I'm a Christian." That's not what makes someone a Christian. Not at all. Do you really know Christ? Have right. you really asked Him to be your Savior? Have you really put your put your trust in Him for forgiveness of your sin, or are you putting your trust in some some water? I right. mean, I, I've said it for years. I had a cat way back in the day. <laughs> I had a cat. Name was uh, name was um, Shake. What a weird name for a cat, right? And um, I, I, I remember telling telling some youth one time, I can baptize my cat. Doesn't make him a Christian. Charlie baptized herself not long ago. <laughs> yes, she did. Yes, she was in the tub. I baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I was baptizing people one day, and I was baptized a couple of ladies, and um, I said, I baptize you, my sister. And Charlie said, I didn't know Dad had so many sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that laughs> it's like funny. that's funny. She's very interested in that. So I just saw that was that was hilarious. Um, we'll wrap up here, but I just want to look at a couple other verses about John's kind of his, his dress. He dressed very interestingly. John was clothed with camel's hair, this is verse 6, and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. There's that, that phrase. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So the main thing I want to talk about here is just kind of his clothing. We can dig into um, verses like 7, 7 and 8 you know, next time. But clothed with camel hair, wearing a leather belt, and he had an interesting diet. Locusts and honey. I, I mean, I really like honey. Maybe you could dip a locust in honey and it turns out okay. I don't know. Some people do it. I mean, you know, it's... it's a, yeah, it's something that they eat in yeah. other places that are not okay. So he was definitely set apart and different. Yeah. That was the big thing with John was he was so set apart and so different. Here he's living in the wilderness, dressing strange, eating stuff that other people aren't eating. Like he was kind of off doing his own thing. He didn't conform. I and that's what I love about him is that he isn't just marching to the beat of his own drum. He's marching to the beat that God is setting mm -hmm. for him and he's okay with that. Yeah. And I would love to be more like that. And what everybody else thought about John didn't matter to John. Right. I mean, he called people out. He called out Herod and yeah. said Look at your sin. Are you ready to repent? And we have a hard time even allowing ourselves to acknowledge to a friend that another friend might be living in sin. 
because we're so afraid of condemning someone else. And it's not about, you know, not loving that person, but identifying sin for sin. John was okay with that. He was. He was. And, yeah, he was bold. Yeah. Yeah, he marched the beat of his own drum, had his own band, wrote his own music, <laughs> did his own thing. And But the people were attracted to him because there was a difference to him. Refreshing. He was, yeah, he was so different than what they were hearing from the the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. He was calling them to something more significant, and they were very attracted to that. I mean, even Herod didn't like being called out for his sin, but he still respected John. He did. Which he is did respect John too, because yeah. I think our hearts, when we hear truth and we're confronted with that, it may be difficult to hear. But I think there is a part of us that longs to hear. Yeah, that I've had truth. I've had people call me out before in in different different phases of my life, and I respected those people. Mm-hmm. I did. It was hard to hear at the moment, but I was like, okay, they're they're kind of mm-hmm. right. You know, I, I examined myself in that moment, and that's a hard thing to do sometimes to kind of turn the spotlight on yourself. Yeah, like what if John's? I I uh, read something that said, what if John was calling you out? What would you do if you were standing on those banks and he's standing in the water calling you out mm-hmm. for your sin? It's a difficult thing to yeah. imagine. It is. It is. But he was he was bold, and we'll see him some more. I mean, you know, he's we're we're gonna we're gonna see him do some more things, and um, we'll even talk about his death his death as well, and how that will affect Christ. That that has mm-hmm. a deep effect on Christ because you know they were. They were related. Right, they're family. Yeah, they were family. So that's kind of an interesting thing, but uh, I've enjoyed this. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. (laughs) But uh, guys, we hope that you um, enjoyed our um, video podcast this week and hope you tune in um, next Tuesday for another one. Um, We're planning on these being released um, every Tuesday. You'll be able to um, find them um, on YouTube and Instagram. So uh, be sure that um, however you're finding us, you're subscribed and get, get notifications so you'll see when they pop up. But we hope that you have a blessed day and we'll see you guys again soon for another uh, episode of the FPC Every Podcast. Have a good evening. Bye.